We've begun our day of reflection with the most powerful prayer of the Holy Rosary. We are blessed also to have celebrated the feast of Our Lady of the Holy Rosary on Wednesday of this week, uh, uh, celebrating the great victory at, in the Battle of Lepanto, uh, 1571, uh, owed, as Pope St. Pius V understood uh, uh, greatly to the intercession of our Blessed Mother through the praying of the rosary and, and rosary processions in the city of Rome, as, as he requested, while the battle was being waged. So if today uh, we rightly feel that we are also in engaged in a battle not at sea, but uh, a battle in our, our very culture, uh, which threatens to, to snuff out the Christian identity of, of our nation and, and constitutes grave temptations for the Christian identity of us as individuals uh, and as a church, uh, we ought to invoke all the more uh, the intercession of Our Lady in fact, first, St. Pius V entitled the feast Our Lady of Victory, and then later, uh, rightly, uh, his successor changed it to Our Lady of the, of the Holy Rosary, but the two things go together. It's through the Holy Rosary that we uh, grow, praying of the Holy Rosary, that Our Lady uh, increases in us our confidence in the victory of Christ, who by his grace, in dwelling in our souls, uh, can even in our greatest weakness give us the victory over sin and eternal death. I will be giving three conferences today, all centered upon the, uh, the sacrament of holy matrimony and its incomparable fruit, the family. Uh, the first conference uh, uh, will address, in a particular way, the particular in a particular way, the crisis of the present moment. Uh, with regard to marriage and the family, which is identified uh, with the uh, Synod of Bishops, which was celebrated last October in uh, the Second Assembly, uh, the the 14th General Assembly on the same subject, which is being celebrated at this very time. And I urge you today to uh, uh, devote your prayers in a particular way uh, for the, the Synod of Bishops, uh, according to the church's discipline, the synod exists. It, it is a gathering of bishops from throughout the world to assist our Holy Father in safeguarding and promoting the doctrine of the faith and in uh, safeguarding and promoting the discipline of the church. And let us pray that the, the synod will indeed be that, especially as it is treating the subjects of marriage and the family. So I will, this first talk is, is with regard to the, the situation of the present moment. The second talk is uh, a catechesis on holy matrimony, which I have taken from the writings, especially from the basic catechism course of the Servant of God, Father John Anthony Hardin, um, who died in December of, uh, of the great jubilee year of 2000, who was a master catechist and uh, who uh, founded in a particular way an apostolate for the spiritual and doctrinal formation of catechists. And the third talk is directed to what I consider uh, a most important subject, and I hope a subject which will be efficaciously taken up in the present assembly of the Synod of Bishops, the preparation for marriage, uh, given the situation in our time. In this first conference, I address the current discussion regarding the fundamental truth of marriage in the church, indicating the importance of the studies provided in the book. And this is a title, and if you have a pencil to write it down, I'm sure there are copies of this available in the bookstore. If not, it can also be ordered online from Ignatius Press, Remaining in the Truth of Christ, Marriage and Communion in the Catholic Church. It's a wonderful collection of essays that illustrate uh, the truth of the teaching on marriage, the church's teaching on marriage, from a number of different perspectives. 
Uh, and it was, ri- it was written to assist the Synod of Bishops in addressing the situation of the family, of marriage in the family in our time. And I will now take up several questions which are related to that treatment. Uh, I might say that the, the book, uh, once you read it, you'll see that it's done by people who are, are very scholarly, but the articles are written to be accessible to the everyday reader. And in fact, I'm told in Italy, the book is translated now in something like seven or eight languages, uh, but I'm told in Italy that some priests are using parts of it for marriage preparation, and that would be uh, something to do. We need to, in every respect, uh, take more seriously the sacred realities of our faith and, above all, the the sacrament of holy matrimony. The first uh, subject I'd like to take up is the current discussion regarding the fundamental truth of marriage. At the present moment in the church, there's perhaps no more critical issue for us to address than the truth about marriage. In a world in which the integrity of marriage has been under attack for decades, the church has remained a faithful herald of the truth about God's plan for man and woman in the faithful, indissoluble, and procreative union of marriage. In the present time, certainly under pressure from a totally secularized culture, a growing confusion and even error has entered into the church, which would weaken seriously, if not totally compromise, the church's witness, and that to the detriment of the whole of society. An interesting story was related to me last fall while the the synod was going on, especially after the the mid-synod report was given, and there was this headline in the New York Times about the revolution in the Catholic Church, suggesting that she was going to abandon her teaching, which is her, it's her teaching because it's our Lord's teaching, on the indissolubility of marriage. Uh, a story was reported to me by a priest who was talking to a, a minister of a Protestant denomination who expressed to him great concern about the situation. And he said, he said, we abandoned these teachings a a long time ago, but we always counted upon the Catholic Church to uphold them. Now, (laughs) it is humorous in a certain way, but, but what it indicates is that those denominations, those who claim to be Christian, and admit the, the, the possibility of entering into a, a new marital union when one is uh, already bound by a prior union, they recognize in, in, the, in, the, in the deepest part of their hearts that this isn't true, that this isn't true to the teaching of Christ. And, and this, this minister gave expression to that. And, uh, this is... Uh, what concerns me very deeply, so many questions, critical questions of our time. The, the Catholic Church also, with great struggle internally, has upheld the Church's teaching, for instance, uh, regard, with regard to uh, contraception and, and, and other teachings, regard to the, the real presence of our Lord in the Holy Eucharist. When other Christian bodies gave up these teachings and became ever more secularized and, and didn't anymore accept the mystery of our faith. And so it's critical in this time, especially on this question of marriage, uh, that the church uphold her teaching. And that not only simply because it's, it's true for our, our own salvation, but also it's for the good of our, the whole of our society. The confusion and error became evident for the world during the recent session that would be the October 2014. I shouldn't call it recent anymore because now we're in a new session. During the October 2014 session of the Third Assembly of the Synod of Bishops, the assembly dedicated to the discussion of the subject, the pastoral challenges of the family in the context of evangelization, found itself, and I was a member of it, so I can say this with a certain uh, authority, found itself addressing in a confused and sometimes erroneous manner practices which contradict the church's constant teaching and practice regarding holy matrimony. 
I refer to practices which would give access to the sacraments to those who are living in a public state of adultery and which would condone in some manner conjugal cohabitation outside of the sacrament of matrimony and genital relations between persons of the same sex. The report given at the midpoint of the synod made strikingly clear the gravity of the situation. The report itself, which lacked practically any consistent reference to the constant teaching of the Church, was a manifesto, a kind of incitement to a new approach to fundamental issues of human sexuality in the Church, an approach which is revolutionary, that is, which is detached from what the Church has always taught and practiced. There is no place in the Roman Catholic Church for revolution. We live in the tradition which has been handed down to us uh, from the time of the apostles. And, and the, the revolution, the major revolution which took place in the church uh, was the Protestant Reformation. And that's not what we're about. The confusion and error was first expressed in a presentation by Cardinal Walter Casper during the extraordinary consistory of February 20th and 21st of 2014. The heart of the extraordinary consistory was a lengthy presentation on marriage and the family by Cardinal Casper, which was followed by an intense discussion by the cardinals present. Cardinal Casper's presentation was quickly published in various languages and became a focus of a wide discussion, especially in the secular media. His presentation raised a number of serious questions about what the Church has always taught and practiced regarding the indissolubility of marriage. It was based upon an interpretation of the Fathers of the Church and on the practice developed in the Eastern Orthodox Churches. Clearly, his presentation called for a discussion which began in earnest during the Extraordinary Consistory itself. After the Extraordinary Consistory, a number of cardinals, including myself, decided to respond as fully and as profoundly as possible to the positions taken by Cardinal Casper. Five cardinals contributed to the study. We cardinals also called upon the help of Archbishop Cyril Vazil of the Society of Jesus, an expert in the practice of the Eastern Orthodox Churches, Father Paul Mankowski, also of the Society of Jesus, an expert in the Sacred Scriptures, and Professor John M. Rist, an expert in the teaching of the Fathers of the Church. We also sought the help of Father Robert Dodaro, an Augustinian friar, president of the Patristic Institute Augustinianum in Rome, for the editing of the book. Apart from his tireless and highly qualified work of editing so important a volume in various languages, it was originally published in in the five major European languages, English, French, German, Italian, and Spanish. Now it's been published in other languages too. But Father Dodaro edited this book in the period of a few months so that it came out simultaneously in five languages. If you have any idea of, of what that took, he, he, I, he, was, he did a, a wonderful work. He attributes it all to Our Lady, by the way. He, he, he constantly told me that uh, I couldn't believe it. It, it. it needed to be done. It was urgent, and I trusted it would be done. But he said to me repeatedly, no, he said it's Our Lady who, who did it. And he also then contributed two very treasured additions to the book, a summary of the argument of the entire book, so that when you read his summary, if you don't have time to sit down and read the whole book, you can see what's in each contribution and go to those things that you need to to find first. And each contribution stands on its own. And then he also provides an appendix which are excerpts from this, from select documents of the magisterium, a very uh, a testimony to the fidelity of the church down the ages to uh, the teaching of our Lord in the gospel on marriage. The fruits of of the 
of our efforts are found in the book Remaining in the Truth of Christ, Marriage and Communion in the Catholic Church, as I said, published in English, French, German, Italian, and Spanish editions in time for the study of the Synod Fathers. As I've already mentioned, Father Dodaro, the editor at the very beginning of the book, gives a summary of the material presented in each of the eight essays which comprise the volume. The essays, in turn, present in a thorough manner the truth of Christ regarding the sacrament of holy matrimony as contained in the Holy Scriptures, as taught and practiced in the early church. They then address the particular practice of the Eastern Orthodox churches and its coherent coherence with doctrine, and the historical challenges uh, to the Lord's teaching recorded in the Gospels. The beauty of the truth of Christ and holy matrimony is then illustrated by presentations on the Church's theological doctrine and her moral teaching, this uh, by Cardinal Ludwig Gerhard Müller, the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, and Cardinal Carlo Cafara, the Archbishop of Bologna in Italy. The last two essays take up the safeguarding and fostering of the truth of Christ regarding holy matrimony in the Church's discipline, her canon law. I commend the book to your reading. While it is scientifically solid, every effort was made to edit the contributions in such a way that they would be accessible to the reading and understanding of serious Catholics and all persons of goodwill. The book has enjoyed a wide readership in the different language editions already published. Since the October 2014 Assembly of the Synod of Bishops, translations into the Polish and Slovak languages have been published. At present, translations into Croatian, Hungarian, and Portuguese are being prepared. The book is truly a point of reference for the most serious matter presently under under discussion by the Synod of Bishops. To assist you in your reflection upon the current discussion, which is the topic of this first presentation, I want to take up now several general considerations which are, in my judgment, key to understanding the situation in which the Church presently finds herself. I offer these considerations in the context of the sound teaching contained in the just-mentioned book. The first consideration is the relationship between faith and culture. Above all, as a presupposition of the discussion of holy matrimony in the current situation, it is important of a correct understanding of the rapport between faith and culture. Many times during the discussions before the first assembly of the Synod and during the, dis- during the actual sessions of that first assembly, and in this time of preparation, or from this, in, the, in the time of preparation for the second assembly, It has been declared that the Church must update its practice and, above all, its language in order to address herself effectively to a totally secularized culture. Some have gone so far as to assert that the Church can no longer speak of the natural law, intrinsically evil acts, irregular unions, and so forth. Their point is that the language itself makes the culture hostile. However, doing so, the Church gives the impression of wanting to draw near to the culture without a clear identity of her own self and of what she has to say to the culture. According to divine wisdom, the Church must always speak the truth with love. Yes, the Church should go to the peripheries of today's culture, as as Pope Francis is constantly urging us, but always secure in her identity, manifesting the greatest compassion which necessarily involves respect for the truth of the cultural situation, which many times is marked by confusion and error regarding the most fundamental truths of human life and its cradle, which is the family. The Church has to call things by their proper name in order not to risk contributing to the confusion and error instead of bringing it to light and order. There's a beautiful passage in Evangelium Vitae, the encyclical letter of St. John Paul II on human life, in which he talks about this, we call it politically correct language, euphemism, uh, with regard to abortion. And he says very clearly 
that we need to call things by their proper name. And then he, he says directly, abortion is murder. Amen. Honest people who live in such a culture have a thirst for the truth and for its proclamation with charity. To encounter the protagonists of such a culture without manifesting the truth of Christ with clear words would be a serious lack of charity. For instance, we think of what the gospel tells us about Christ's meeting with the people, that he found them to be like sheep without a shepherd, and that he therefore instructed them. We think also of the meeting of our Lord with a Samaritan woman at the well of Jacob or with the woman discovered in open adultery. Our Lord doesn't mollycoddle people. He's very, very kind and very compassionate, but he speaks very directly. The dialogue between himself and the Samaritan woman is very illustrative. The Lord is full of understanding for their situation. He pardons them, but at the same time, he is attentive to indicate to them the necessity of leaving a life of sin, the necessity of sinning no more. So that is the first uh, subject I wanted to address. All in the discussions in October of, of 2014 and, and since, oftentimes a discourse which was given by St. John the Twenty Third on the opening day of the Second Vatican Ecumenical Council is cited. The discourse is entitled Gaud et Mater Ecclesia, Mother Church Rejoices. And it, it, it isn't part of the magisterium. It's his own personal uh, expression of, of enthusiasm about the synod at its opening. And in it, in, I must say, in a naive way, and we can all be naive from time to time, he expresses a great confidence that if the church just represents, again, her teaching, that the culture is ready and waiting to embrace it. And so he, he's filled with confidence about the council. And there's no question that he thought that the council would take no longer than one session. Uh, just a question of holding up certain teachings of the church again. But what he didn't realize was that, was that there was already brewing in the culture the fruits of, of philosophical errors which had come from earlier centuries, uh, German idealism and rationalism, and which had also sadly infiltrated the church was under the surface and with the whole uh, cultural turmoil of the 1960s erupted in a way uh, that has, has been terribly damaging uh, uh, to the life of the church, such that if you, I'm often, I hope I get to, to do it, but wanted to write an article contrasting his speech at the opening of the Second Vatican Council and several texts of Pope Paul VI in the late 60s and 1970s in which he is clearly in anguish. The one that's most famous, and I'm sure you've heard it quoted, is the homily he gave on the feasts of Saints Peter and Paul in 1972, uh, in which he, he talks about, he said, we believed uh, that with the council we were ushering in a, a time of light and of freedom and of love. And instead, we find ourselves in a, in a darkness and that we, we delight in, 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 in going ever deeper into the darkness instead of, 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 of dispelling it with the light. And he, and he said, I, I, I sense that through some opening, some fissure uses the word, that the smoke of Satan has entered into the sanctuaries of the church. And there's no question he was referring to the, to the liturgical reform, which had gone very much awry. And so uh, uh, and now, <laughs> curiously enough, uh, some of the proponents of this so-called new approach, revolutionary approach to marriage, were, were re rejoicing that the church is returning to that spirit of the Second Vatican Council. And whenever you hear that, you must be absolutely attentive uh, because the spirit of the Second Vatican Council has nothing to do with the teaching of the Second Vatican Council, I can assure you. And, uh, and, and then quoting this, this famous address of, of, of Pope St. John the Twenty-Third, I can 
I am certain that the, that the saint uh, had no idea in, uh, when he gave that speech of what would actually happen. It, it's simply a question as can happen with any one, any one of us. He, he misjudged the times. And uh, um, anyway, I must say, uh, I have been giving presentations. I felt a particular urgency during this time in various parts of the world. And uh, I find that, that people who uh, uh, don't necessarily agree with me, and even secular people, they, they want to hear what the church teaches. And I can assure you today, and in all these talks I've given, I have no new ideas of my own. All, all I have to present to you is, is what the church teaches you, and that's what will save your soul. My ideas will not, and, and you can be sure of that. And so, uh, uh, but I, I, this is my, uh, my experience, that, that people are really are longing to hear these things in a certain way, um, uh, people are counting the, the Catholic Church in a certain way represents a, a last hope for the culture, which they, they people realize the culture is, is, is decaying. It, it's, it's, it, it can't, this can't last, this can't go on. It, it, it's, it's, it's suicidal. The second topic is the confusion regarding the nature of the Synod of Bishops. Oftentimes, in popular presentations of the work of the Synod of Bishops, the impression is given that the Church's teaching and practice will be altered by a majority vote of the Synod Fathers. But the Synod of Bishops has no authority to change doctrine and discipline, none whatsoever. The nature and purpose of the Synod of Bishops is described in Canon 342 of the Code of Canon Law, which I will now read. The Synod of Bishops is a group of bishops who have been chosen from different regions of the world and meet together at fixed times to foster closer unity between the Roman Pontiff and bishops to assist the Roman Pontiff with their counsel in the preservation and growth of faith and morals, in the preservation and growth of faith and morals, and in the observance and strengthening of ecclesiastical discipline, and to consider questions pertaining to the activity of the church in the world. The Synod of Bishops is not convened by the Roman Pontiff to suggest changes in the doctrine and discipline of the church, but rather to assist the Roman Pontiff in safeguarding and promoting sound doctrine regarding faith and morals and in strengthening the discipline by which the truths of the faith are lived in practice. The next topic I want to take up is the risk of sentimentalism. Reflecting upon the situations of profound suffering in families which find themselves outside of the context of the truth of Christ, there is the risk of falling into sentimentalism which, while it seems compassionate, is deeply harmful because of its lack of respect for the objective situation of the persons involved. Such sentimentalism blocks the encounter with Christ on the part of the person who is in sin. Sentimentalism sees the truth of Christ as something hurtful to the person and thus does not speak the truth which is the only way for the person in his time to abandon the sin in question. Sentimentalism also fails to respect the profound effect of the irregular situation of the person on so many other persons bound to him by relationships of family or friendship. Concentrating ourselves exclusively on the painful situation of the individual, we do not see reality in its integrity and thus bring about injustice not only to the individual, but to the others bound to him. One of the examples of this, of this sentimentalism is a hearkening to what's called the injustice done to the children of parents who are in an irregular union, as if the word of Christ, the teaching of Christ on the indissolubility of marriage is causing an injustice to these children, I mean, that's said frequently, and if people don't think very deeply, they can kind of 
get emotionally worked up about that and say, oh, yes, we should then let these, these parents be fully uh, uh, admitted to the sacraments. Yes, the children are in, are in a situation of suffering, but it's owed to the, the sin of the, of, of the breakdown of the marriage and, and, and of the entering into a, an, an invalid uh, matrimonial union. It's not due to the teaching of Christ. And, it, and it's no remedy to the situation to water down or to, or to falsify the teaching of Christ. I liken it to parents with children. Uh, when a, a child does something very wrong, uh, a parent has to be firm, loving, but, but firm. And firmness is what leads uh, to correction. And all of us have seen what happens in families where this kind of sentimentalism, this, uh, this false compassion is constantly excusing the, the errors of children and their misconduct and so forth. And, uh, and the children, uh, uh, instead of growing up to be a beautiful uh, tree, turn out to be weeds in the sense of they're in, in all kinds of trouble uh, because they haven't received what, what they need. And all of us are the same way in the church. We need to hear the truth of Christ, the truth of the moral law, in order to develop into who we really are. The third... Maybe it's the fourth, I don't know. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the next topic is the radical modification of the process for the declaration of nullity of marriage. Uh, speaking of... Oh, thank you, Father Elias. <clears throat> speaking of the temptation of sentimentalism or false compassion... I would like to say a word about the quite widely publicized proposal, and now it's actually come to be a, a reality, uh, to modify radically the process for the declaration of nullity of marriage so that the parties in a cause of nullity could receive more easily and quickly such a declaration. Uh, I, uh, the Holy Father is, in the meantime, on September Eighth issued two motu proprios in which he has effectively uh, altered radically the, the process for the declaration of nullity of marriage. Notwithstanding that legislation, I, I want to illustrate a, a couple of principles which do not change with regard to declarations of nullity of marriage. I want to address the nature and substance of the canonical process for the declaration of nullity of marriage. In the last chapter in the book, Remaining in the Truth of Christ, I uh, treat that subject uh, with special reference to the situation in the United States. In his presentation to the Extraordinary Consistory and in other declarations, Cardinal Casper has asserted that the process for the declaration of nullity of marriage is not of divine law and therefore could be radically altered. He has suggested an administrative process, for example, a meeting of the bishop or of a priest delegated by the bishop with the party who accuses his marriage of nullity, on the basis of which the bishop would declare the nullity of the marriage. While it is true that the process in its individual elements is not of divine law, a process apt for the discovery of the truth about the, about the marriage accused of nullity is absolutely of divine law. The present process is a fruit of centuries of experience of the church in the just treatment of an accusation of marriage nullity, and as the Venerable Pope Pius XII brilliantly illustrated in his address to the Roman Rhoda, which is the tribunal of the Pope for uh, such causes of nullity of marriage and other, other causes which are brought to him, in his address in 1944, uh, he uh, treated the various elements uh, of the process which adapt it, make it apt, for the discovery of the truth about situations of the breakup of marriage, which situations, I must say, in my experience, are normally quite complex. Uh, <clears throat> for, the most, for the more simple causes, for example, a case of a person who attempted a marriage when he was already bound to a pre-existing marriage, 
There is the documentary process already in the law with its appropriate speed. As I explain in in my contribution to Remaining in the Truth of Christ, Marriage and Communion in the Catholic Church, to alter the actual process without respect for its historical development risks taking away from the process the possibility of arriving at a just conclusion, a judgment given with moral certitude according to the truth discovered by means of the process. And let me make clear to you what is the, the, the result of the process. A person comes to the matrimonial tribunal of the bishop. The bishop is the first judge in the diocese, but because these cases are complex and many bishops are not prepared to judge them, they rightly give this work to a priest and or priests whom they've sent to study, and also sometimes they have qualified lay persons and religious who work with them uh, to judge these cases for them. What are they judging? They're judging an accusation of nullity of marriage. Someone comes forward and says, for instance, I accuse my nullity of marriage because either I or my partner excluded with a positive act of the will uh, the good of offspring. In other words, one of the parties, uh, by a positive act of the will, excluded procreation. There would be no children in the marriage. It could also be excluded the, the good of fidelity, that one or other of the parties intended with a positive act of the will to be unfaithful in the marriage. So the person brings forward that accusation. What the, the tribunal work then is to prove that that accusation has been demonstrated. And the final judgment is that it has been established that the marriage was null on this this or that ground. For instance, the exclusion of offspring or the exclusion of fidelity or the exclusion of indissolubility. And there are other grounds as well. The church does not declare that the marriage is absolutely invalid. It can't. Only God knows that. And it it has some language which has come out from the Synod of Bishops has suggested it doesn't judge the validity of the marriage. In other words, if it gives a negative judgment, that's not a declaration that the marriage is valid. It's simply a declaration that hasn't been shown that it's invalid. So it's, it's a limited judgment which is humanly possible to be made with moral certitude. And uh, and, and people who bring a cause of nullity to the church should have this in mind, uh, to come with complete sincerity and honesty, knowing that God knows the truth about the marriage. Uh, they believe that it's null, and they leave to the, the church with her process to decide whether or not they've been able to establish that nullity. I, I hope that that may be somewhat helpful to you, but there are many misunderstandings misunderstandings in this regard. The next subject I take up is the fullness of power of the Roman pontiff and absolute power. In a similar way, some have suggested that the fullness of power of the Roman pontiff means that he is able to to dissolve any marriage. Such a suggestion does not respect the necessary distinction between the fullness of power and absolute power. The fullness of power of the Roman pontiff is at the service of the truth of the doctrine and of the discipline of the church. The Holy Father exercises his power with total obedience to Christ and cannot make decisions contrary to the truth of Christ, appealing to an absolute and therefore arbitrary power. The discipline contained in Canon 1141 of the Code of Canon Law remains true also for the Roman Pontiff. This is how the Canon reads. A marriage that is ratum et et consumatum, that is a marriage which has been contracted uh, validly and has been consummated with the conjugal act, can be dissolved by no human power and by no cause except death. It doesn't say except death or, uh, or a decision of the Roman pontiff, because these are, these are, are divine realities. This, it, it, no, no Roman pontiff would want to, to, to touch such a thing. 
The same discipline of divine law is contained in Canon 853 of the Code of Canons of the Eastern Churches. It is clearly absurd to affirm that the Roman pontiff has power to change divine law. It's just an absurdity. The next topic is the relationship between doctrine and discipline. In what regards the canonical process for the declaration of nullity of marriage, it is frequently said that changes in the process can be introduced without touching in any manner the doctrine on the indissolubility of marriage. But it is evident that an inadequate process for arriving at the truth regarding a marriage accused of nullity would bring with it a lack of due respect for the indissolubility of holy matrimony. In fact, in the United States of America, our beloved homeland, from 1971 to 1983, a very modified process with the diminution of the figure of the defender of the bond and the effective elimination of the double agreeing sentence, in other words, the checking of an affirmative sentence in first instance by a, a, a higher tribunal, it was permitted by the Holy See with time and not without reason, the process for the declaration of nullity of marriage became popularly known as Catholic divorce. In other words, in the common perception, while the church was declaring the indissolubility of marriage in its teaching, in its practice, it was permitting parties held to a marriage bond to marry another person without having first demonstrated the nullity of the earlier marriage bond. I served for many years at the Apostolic Signatura, which has the responsibility for the right administration of justice in the church and uh, supervises the work of over a thousand tribunals. Uh, first, I served there as defender of the bond from 1989 to 1995, and then as prefect from 2008 until November of last year. In a consistent manner, the experience of the apostolic signatura shows that when a matrimonial tribunal has well-prepared staff, the causes proceed without unjustified delays. At the same time, a process to reach a decision in so important and delicate a matter has of necessity its proper times for gathering the proofs, for examining them, and at the end, for giving a judgment with moral certitude. And by moral certitude, we mean that there is no reasonable doubt to the contrary. With sadness, many times I have seen that the diocesan bishop has not sufficiently taken care to prepare well the necessary personnel for his tribunal. In other words, it's not the process that has need of modifications, but the practice of some bishops who do not pre prepare, do not provide well-prepared and just workers for their tribunals. It, it has to be clear, too, that it isn't a question only of having a degree in canon law, of being well-prepared in that sense, but it has to be a person of right doctrine. In other words, a person can use even canon law in a dishonest way to produce unjust decisions, and so uh, the bishop has to be careful that, that he is, and first and foremost, that he has the priests who are working in the tribunal are of sound doctrine, and then that they have the knowledge of canon law in order to, to judge properly these cases. I'd now like to talk about a new evangelization and the family. The discussion of holy matrimony and of the family during the synod was presented in terms of evangelization. The frequent appeal of Pope Francis to the church to go to the peripheries has, has as its scope the evangelization of the people who live at the peripheries. Such evangelization, according to the teaching of Pope St. John Paul II, leads us to attain the high standard of ordinary Christian living which is found in the gospel and in the living tradition of the church. I commend very much to you the reading of the apostolic letter, which Pope St. John Paul II wrote at the conclusion of the celebration of the great jubilee of the year 2000, in which he uh, 
discusses uh, the program of the church in our time, in, which is the same as it has always been, holiness of life in Christ. And especially uh, you'll find in Numbers 20, 29, I think, to like 32 or 33, a wonderful reflection. As observed before, the synod, therefore, has the task of suggesting the ways for the church to be more faithful to the truth of marriage and of the family taught to us by the gospel and by the living tradition. Regarding Christian marriage and the family and the call to evangelization, already in the post-synodal apostolic exhortation, Familiaris Consortio, Pope St. John Paul II declared that the Christian family, in fact, is the first community called to announce the gospel to the human person during growth and to bring him or her through a progressive education and catechesis to full human and Christian maturity. Noting the multiple and grievous attacks on marriage and the family in our time, Pope John Paul II stressed the importance of witnessing to the truth about marriage and the family so that the family may evangelize the whole of society. He declared, At a moment in hist- of history in which the family is the object of numerous forces that seek to destroy it or in some way to deform it, and aware that the well-being of society and her own good are intimately tied to the good of the family, the Church perceives in a more urgent and compelling way her mission of proclaiming to all people the plan of God for marriage and the family, ensuring their full vitality and human and Christian development, and thus contributing to the renewal of society and of the people of God. In the present moment, when the attacks on matrimony and on the family seem the most ferocious, It is the church which must show to the whole of society the truth in all its richness, and therefore the beauty and goodness of marriage and of the family. The church accomplishes its mission of evangelization of the family with its teaching, with the celebration of the sacraments, and with the life of prayer and devotion, and with its discipline. I'll have the occasion in my last presentation to show how the church carries out this evangelization uh, through the sacraments when I talk about the preparation for the celebration of the rite of marriage and, and the rite itself. The church and therefore the synod must give special attention to the holiness of marriage, to the fidelity, to the indissolubility, and to the fecundity of the matrimonial union. Christian family life is necessarily a sign of contradiction in today's culture. The synod ought to be the occasion for the universal church to give inspiration and strength to Catholic couples for the witness to the truth of Christ, of which our culture has such great need. The synod ought to be a help to Christian families in being, according to the ancient description, the church at home. We call the domestic church, the first place in which the Catholic faith is taught, celebrated, and lived. The faithful living in a marriage in difficulty must certainly enjoy the particular attention of the church, who, in imitation of the Savior, announces to them the truth of Christ and brings to them the grace of Christ to live faithfully and generously the marriage vocation to the end. In the same Familiaris Consortio, Pope St. John Paul II underlined the irreplaceable service of the family in the evangelization of the world. Citing the teaching of Blessed Paul VI, he declared, Blessed Pope Paul VI, he declared, to the extent in which the Christian family accepts the gospel and matures in faith, it becomes an evangelizing community. Let us listen again to Paul the Sixth, and he quotes Blessed Paul the Sixth. The family, like the church, ought to be a place where the gospel is transmitted, and from the gospel, and from which the gospel radiates. 
In a family which is conscious of this mission, all the members evangelize and are evangelized. The parents not only communicate the gospel to their children, but from their children they can themselves receive the same gospel as deeply lived by them. And such a family becomes the evangelizer of many other families and of the neighborhood of which it forms a part. It is clear that if evangelization is not found in marriages, in Christian homes and families, it will not be found in the church and in society. At the same time, marriages transformed by the gospel are the first and most powerful force for the transformation of society through the gospel and the living tradition of the church. Later on, I will reflect on a corollary question, which is of of critical importance to parents in the handing on of the faith and its practice to their children, namely the question of education. The next topic I wish to address is confidence in the natural law and in the grace of matrimony. Confronting the sufferings of individual persons and of families, the church should not lose its confidence in the natural law inscribed in every human heart and in its full expression in the saving work of our Lord. In our culture, there is a confusion about the meaning of human sexuality, which is bearing the fruit of profound personal unhappiness, which often leads to the breakup of marriage, to the corruption of children and young people, and ultimately to self-destruction. Disordered sexual activity, sexual activity outside of marriage, and the media's constant, powerful, and false messages regarding our identity as man and woman are all signs of the urgent need of a new evangelization which begins in marriages, in families, and through marriages reaches the entire culture. There is need of the witness to the distinct gifts of man and of woman who both dispose themselves to the service of Christ and of his mystical body by means of a chaste life. Christian marriage is the first place of such necessary witness in our culture. Children learn chastity first and foremost by the chastity of their parents, by the chaste manner in which their parents live the matrimonial vocation. By means of a sound family life, our culture will be transformed. Without sound family life, the culture will not ever be transformed. In the life of holy couples, we see reflected all of the splendor of the truth about the union of a man and woman in faithful and enduring and procreative love. In their life, we see above all the truth of the teaching of Christ in response to the Pharisees who were putting him to the test, posing the question of the possibility of divorce. The Lord responded to the Pharisees, teaching the observance of the eternal law according to which God the Father created man and woman. This is the response of our Lord. Have you not read that he who made them from the beginning made them male and female, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one? So they are no longer two, but one. What therefore God has joined together, let no man put asunder. When the disciples asked about the great exigency of the divine law for spouses, the disciples said, well, if it's that way, maybe it's better not to marry. (laughs) But the Lord responded that with the vocation to the married life, God grants in abundance the grace to live such faithful, enduring, and procreative love. Not all men can receive this precept, but only those to whom it is given. God always gives the grace, even to those who are the weakest, to live faithfully the matrimonial state, if that is is their calling. And the Lord also, it's very interesting in this passage taken from the Gospel according to St. Matthew, he talks also about celibacy in the same context which today, too, people say this is impossible. No one can live this way. 
the Lord gives the grace for the building up of his holy, holy church. Father Paul Mankowski, at the conclusion of his essay on the Holy Scriptures in the book Remaining in the Truth of Christ, Marriage and Communion in the Catholic Church, writes, there was at the time uh, a debate between two groups in, 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 the, in the Jewish religion. Uh, one was seen to be more rigorous and one more lax with regard to the question of divorce. So this is what Father Mankowski writes, Yet it is mistaken or if not wholly mistaken, seriously incomplete, to view Jesus as a disputant who championed the rigorous side of legal moral controversy. You know, to reduce our Lord to a, a, a kind of an adherent to one part of a controversy. And whose appeal was, and is solely to the tough-minded. For he also promised a new and superabundant outpouring of grace, of divine help, so that no person, however fragile, should find it impossible to do God's will. It is this objective reality which St. Paul celebrates in the letter to the Ephesians with these inspired words. And I'd like to read this passage from Ephesians 5, verses 31 to 33. In a certain way, it, it, it is the, the great truth which we are honoring throughout this day. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Even so, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no man ever hates his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. This is to, to draw attention to the intimacy of the matrimonial union. It's like the intimacy of our relationship with our own body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. He quotes the passage from the book of Genesis. This is a great mystery. And I mean in reference to Christ and the church. By, by mystery, we don't mean some puzzle. But we, uh, but we mean a reality which is, is beyond our our, our full comprehension because it is a divine reality, and, and that is what holy matrimony is. This is a great mystery, and I mean in reference to Christ and the church. How let, however, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. The next topic I would like to take up is the natural law and the formation of the conscience in the family. So often today, a notion of tolerance of ways of thinking and acting contrary to the moral law seems to be the interpretive key, interpretative key for many Christians. Today's popular notion of tolerance is not securely grounded in the moral tradition, yet it tends to dominate our approach to the extent that we end up claiming to be Christian while tolerating ways of thinking and acting which are diametrically opposed to the moral law revealed to us in nature and in the sacred scriptures. The approach at times becomes so relativistic and subjective that we do not even observe the fundamental logical principle of non-contradiction, that is, that a thing cannot both be and not be at the same time. In other words, certain actions cannot at the same time be both true to the moral law and not true to it. That's a principle we could practice a lot more in our time. In fact, charity alone must be the interpretive key of our thoughts and actions. In the context of charity, tolerance means unconditional love of the person who is involved in evil, but complete abhorrence of the evil into which the person has fallen. I remember from my 
childhood, we were constantly taught, love the sinner, but hate the sin. But this notion of tolerance levels that, and so we end up, our love for the sinner turns out to be also, in in some way, an acceptance, hopefully not a love, of, of the sin itself. Fundamental to the Catholic life of virtue is the understanding of human nature and conscience. Critical to the deplorable cultural situation in which we find ourselves is the loss of the sense of nature and of conscience. Pope Benedict XVI addressed the question of the loss of a sense of nature and conscience with respect to the foundations of law in his address to the German parliament, the Bundestag, during his pastoral visit to Germany in September of 2011. Taking leave from the story of the young King Solomon on his accession to the throne, he recalled to political leaders the teaching of the Holy Scriptures regarding the work of politics. God asked King Solomon what request he wished to make as he began to rule God's holy people. The Holy Father, Pope Benedict, commented, What will the young ruler ask for at this important moment? Success, wealth, long life, destruction of his enemies? He chooses none of these. Instead, he asks for a listening heart so that he may govern God's people and discern between good and evil. The story of King Solomon, as Pope Benedict XVI observed, teaches what must be the end of political activity and therefore of government. Actually, what must be the end of every one of our thoughts and words and actions must flow from a listening heart that we discern good from evil, choose the good, and reject the evil. He declared, politics must be a striving for justice, and hence it has to establish the fundamental preconditions for peace. To serve right and to fight against the dominion of wrong is and remains the fundamental task of the politician, fundamental task of each one of us. Pope Benedict XVI then asked how, how we know the good and right which the political order, and specifically the law, are to safeguard and and promote. While he acknowledged that in many matters, this is referring to the world of government, the support of the majority can serve as a sufficient criterion, he observed that such a principle is not sufficient for the fundamental issues of law in which the dignity of man and of humanity is at stake. Regarding the very foundations of the life of society, positive civil law must respect, and I quote, nature and reason as the true sources of law. In other words, one must have recourse to the natural moral law which God has inscribed upon every human heart. What Pope Benedict XVI observed regarding the foundations of law in the concepts of nature and conscience points to the fundamental work of education, the work of developing in students the listening heart or developing in our children a listening heart which strives to know the law of God and to respect it by development in the life of the virtues. Time does not permit me to address the place of education in bringing the human person to full human and Christian maturity. Suffice it to say... Parents must be vigilant that the education given to their children be coherent with the Christian education and upbringing in the home. Even as the family is essential to a new evangelization, so also is education because of its intrinsic connection with the growth and development of the child in Christ. Today, one one cannot be vigilant enough. Uh, I'm sad to say, and I say it with a tremendous sense of regret, that many schools undo what the parents have have, uh, 
formed in their children in a, in a very radical and, 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 and grave manner. And so any of you who are parents of children, I just ask you to be very attentive and to know fully if you are sending your children uh, to either public or Catholic schools, to know fully what the curriculum is and, and what the life of the school is and whether, whether it is coherent and supportive uh, of, of what you're teaching your children at home. The thoroughly galvanized anti-life and anti-family agenda of our time advances in large part because of a lack of attention and information among the general public. The pervasive mass media, the powerful promoter of the agenda, confuse and corrupt minds and hearts and dull consciences to the law written by God upon every human heart. In his encyclical letter on the gospel of life, Pope John Paul II declared, what is urgently called for is a general mobilization of consciences and a united ethical effort to activate a great campaign in support of life. Altogether, we must build a new culture of life, new because it will be able to confront and solve today's unprecedented problems affecting human, li- affecting human life, new because it will be adopted with deeper and more dynamic conviction by all Christians, new because it will be capable of bringing about a serious and courageous cultural dialogue among all parties. While the urgent need for such a cultural transformation is linked to the present historical situation, it is also rooted in the Church's mission of evangelization. The purpose of the gospel, in fact, is to transform humanity from within and make it new. Like the yeast which leavens the whole measure of dough, the gospel is meant to permeate all cultures and give them life from within, so that they may express the full truth about the human person and about human life. What Pope John Paul II affirmed about the mobilization of consciences regarding the inviolability of innocent human life surely applies as well and as strongly to the mobilization of consciences regarding the integrity of marriage and family life. Pope John Paul II did not fail to note that such efforts must begin with the renewal of a culture of life within Christian communities themselves. The Church herself must address the situation of so many of her members who, even though they may be active in Church activities, end up by separating their Christian faith from its ethical requirements regarding life and thus fall into moral subjectivism and certain objectionable ways of acting. I don't have time to go into it this morning, but it's very important in in educating our children to educate them in the truth about conscience. Today, by many, the term conscience is used to justify doing whatever I think. And the people say, well, that's, that's what you think, that's your conscience. My conscience tells me differently. Well, the conscience is oriented to the truth, which is one, and it's the same for all of us. And the the, the conscience has to be well-formed, and when it is well-formed, then we don't, uh, uh, on, on the fundamental questions, there should be no uh, disagreement uh, among us about what is the right and good thing to do. We live in a time, I've now come to the conclusion, lest you think that that was never going to happen. <laughs> I, I could say more, actually, but... Uh, I have my limitations, and I'm sure that you have your limitations, too, sitting on those hard benches. We live in a time when the fundamental truth of marriage is under a ferocious, indeed, I would not hesitate to say, a diabolical attack. I'm very convinced about that. (laughs) Which seeks to obscure and sully the sublime beauty of the married state as God intended it from the creation. Divorce is a commonplace in society, as is the pretension to remove from the conjugal union by mechanical or chemical means its procreative essence. And now society has gone even further in its affront to God and his law by claiming the name of marriage 
for liaisons between persons of the same sex. I refuse to refer to these, certainly I don't refer to them as matrimonial unions or marital unions, and I do not refer to them either as sexual unions, because this is not human sexuality. It's, and we, we shouldn't use that kind of language. And I also don't refer to traditional marriage, because there's only one marriage. There's not traditional marriage and some other kind of marriage. So... Um, I understand the term, and it's actually beautiful because it's marriage according to the, to the tradition in the sense of from the beginning. But I'm afraid today, by using that, that terminology, we give space to people who say, yes, but we, there's another kind of marriage that you're not uh, considering. Even within the church, there are those who would obscure the truth of the indissolubility of marriage in the name of mercy this false compassion that I talked about, sentimentalism, or who who would condone the violation of the conjugal union by means of contraception in the name of pastoral understanding, and who in the name of tolerance would remain silent about the attack on the very integrity of marriage as the union of one man and one woman. There are even those, too, and I've heard it, who deny that the married receive a particular grace to live heroically, in faithful, enduring, and life-giving love. We're we're all called to be heroes. It's not just for a few uh, special people. It's it's the call. All of us are called to live that extraordinary nature of, of our ordinary Christian life. Our Lord himself has assured us that God gives to the married the grace to live daily in accord with the truth of their state in life. And all... I'm not talking about some marriage under a bell jar, some uh, uh, cakewalk, some uh, bowl of cherries. We all know, each of us in our own vocation, the hardships, the trials, the temptations, the difficulties, uh, sometimes profound sorrows which come to us. But what we know even more is that constant presence of our Lord with us, with his grace, which sustains us. And even in the moments of the greatest weakness, uh, in the moments of the greatest trial, wins his victory in us. In our day, the witness to the splendor of the truth of of marriage must be limpid and heroic. We must be ready to suffer, as Christians have suffered down the ages, to honor and foster holy matrimony. Let us take as our examples St. John the Baptist, St. John Fisher, and St. Thomas More, who were martyrs in defending the integrity of of the fidelity and indissolubility of holy matrimony. In the face of the confusion and error about holy matrimony, which Satan is sowing so widely in our society today, let us follow their example and let us invoke their intercession so that the great gift of married life and love will be ever more revered in the church and in society.